Our final test that we'll look at is one that's known as the ratio test. The ratio test, as the name implies, requires us to take the ratio of some terms of the sequence. In particular, we're going to take the ratio of a sub n plus 1 to a sub n, and we're going to look to see what happens to that as it n goes to infinity. Why do we do that? Well, there are some very good reasons, of course, and we won't get into all the details, but the reason we're doing that is because over time, the terms should get smaller and smaller and smaller and approach zero if the series is going to converge, which is why we do the next term in the sequence over the previous term. If that ratio approaches some number L that's greater or that's less than one, then the series not only is convergent, but is absolutely convergent. So it's a rather powerful test. If that ratio approaches some number L which is greater than one, or if the limit goes to infinity, then the series diverges. And if the ratio approaches one, well, we're going to have to find a different test. It's inconclusive. So we can use the ratio test to determine if a series is absolutely convergent. There are now two ways that we know to do that. One is to use the ratio test, of course. The other is to take the series and drop all of the negative signs from them. Now the ratio test is most useful when we have factorials and when we have geometric, which we also would think of as exponential expressions. If you have a rational function, that's a sequence, that is a rational function, the ratio test is probably, well, definitely not going to be useful at all. The ratio test is actually based upon or proven using um, geometric series. <clears throat> and remember that a geometric series converges when the common ratio is less than one, and the geometric series convert diverges when it's greater than one. When the common ratio is equal to plus or minus one, um, it diverges, but in our case, it could the series could converge, so you'd have to use a different test. We're going to look at several examples here. We're going to use the ratio test to determine if this is an absolutely convergent sequence series. So in our case, a sub n is equal to negative 1 to the n minus 1 and cubed over 5 to the nth. We want to look at the limit as n goes to infinity, the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 divided by a sub n, and see what that is. Okay. Now, before I go any further, um, I want to make a comment about why I might be inclined, other than the directions telling us to use the ratio test, why I might be inclined to use the ratio test. I see this 5 to the nth in here. That makes me believe I want to use the ratio test. Okay. It's a geometric sequence that 5 to the nth is. All right, so now back to our problem. We've got the limit as n goes to infinity. In the denominator, we will have a sub n exactly as it's written above here. So it's going to be negative 1 to the n minus 1, n cubed over 5 to the nth. In the numerator, we have a sub n plus 1. I'm going to do this very carefully here. In the um, what that means is, in our formula, we have to replace each n by n plus 1. So we'll end up with negative 1 to the n plus 1 minus 1, and then n plus 1 cubed divided by 5 to the n plus 1. Blah. Okay, well, here's the thing. We have a fraction within a fraction, so we can take the reciprocal of the denominator and multiply by that. So we'll end up with, the numerator stays the same. I'm going to simplify a little bit. It'll be negative 1 to the nth, n plus 1 cubed, divided by 5 to the n plus 1, multiplied by the reciprocal of the denominator, which is 5 to the n, and then negative 1 to the n minus 1, n cubed. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to address the absolute value. Much of the stuff inside is positive. The 5 to the nth is positive, the 5 to the n plus 1, the n plus 1 cubed, and the n cubed. Those are all positive. The negative 1 to the nth and the negative 1 to the n minus 1, those could each be negative, but they could also be positive. But either way, they're going to be 
one when we take the absolute value. So we're going to go ahead and just eliminate those, okay? Because I'm doing the absolute value, they're not gonna make any difference. In fact, if you simplified it, you would get negative one. When you divide the two, the absolute value of negative one is positive one. So we get the limit as n goes to infinity. What I like to do is collect things that are of the same form. So I've got two things that are cubed. I'm going to collect them into one fraction, n plus one cubed divided by n cubed. And then I have the five to the nth over five to the n plus one. <clears throat> the first term, now notice I've dropped the absolute values. Everything inside is positive. We get the limit as n goes to infinity. The first factor there, I could write as n plus one over n cubed. And then the second factor, I've got five to the n, which means I have n factors of five. In the denominator, I have n plus one factors of five. I've got one more factor of five in the denominator, so that reduces to one fifth. Now we can let n go to infinity. Inside the parentheses there, I see the n plus one in the numerator and then the n in the denominator. I'm gonna show you two different ways to look at this. One is sort of the quick way that I've demonstrated in other videos, and the other is a little bit longer way, but it kind of gives, I mean, it definitely gives the same result. So the way I like to look at this is in the numerator, I have n and I have one. The most influential term there as n is large is the n that's there, okay? In the long run, the one is insignificant. In the denominator, I also have n. So really, this can be thought of when n is large, it's going to be approximately the same as n divided by n, and so that's going to approach 1. And so that's going to be 1 times 1 fifth, which is 1 fifth, which is less than 1. So the series converges absolutely by the ratio test. Okay. Now, the second way you could do this is you could actually divide the n plus 1 over n, which I'll do over here. n plus 1 over n would be n over n plus 1 over n, which becomes 1 plus 1 over n. As n goes to infinity, the 1 over n will approach 0, and overall we'll end up with 1. So that's a very nice example to start with. Um, the reason, uh, going back to this second method, um, the reason I don't tend to do that is because you could end up with n over n plus one, and that's not so easy to rewrite in a fashion like one plus one over n. <clears throat> For our next example, we're going to, wow, um, get kind of crazy here. In the numerator, we have a product of 1, 3, 5, I'm guessing 7, 9, and so forth, out to 2n minus 1. In the denominator, we have 4 to the nth and n factorial. Now, before I go through this, I really want to see what this thing looks like. Okay, so in the first term, the first term is when n is equal to 1. When n is 1, the first term will end up with 4 to the first, which I'll just write as 4, times 1 factorial, which I'll just leave off. Well, I'll write as 1. In the numerator, the numerator says we're going to take the product of all odd integers from 1 up to 2n minus 1. Well, if n is 1, 2 times 1 minus 1 equals 1. Oh, okay, so we get 1 there. When n is 2, we get 4 squared in the denominator and a 2 factorial in the denominator. In the numerator, we have all the product of all odd numbers from 1 up to 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 3, 1 times 3. I think I see the pattern here. I have 4 cubed in the denominator, 3 factorial also in the denominator, and then in the numerator, I have 2 times 3 minus 1. That's the last odd number I multiply, which is 5, 1 times 3 times 5. And I see the pattern. I have a product of a certain number of odd integers. Each new term brings on a new odd integer. And in the, in the denominator, I have that kind of stuff. Okay, the 4 to the n and the n factorial. Okay, so in our case, a sub n is going to be 1 times 3 times 5 
out to 2n minus 1, all divided by 4 to the n multiplied by n factorial. Okay, I'm going to write out what a sub n plus 1 looks like. a sub n plus 1 would be the product of all odd integers from 1, whoops, out to, I'm going to leave some space here, I'll explain why, 2 times, remember we place n, we replace n by n plus 1. So it's 2 times the quantity n plus 1 minus 1 divided by 4 to the n plus 1 times n plus 1 factorial. Now why did I leave that space? I left that space because I want to remember that the numerator is the product of all odd integers out to this particular odd integer. Well, each new term, we're going from a sub n to a sub n plus 1, each new term brings about a new factor, a new odd number, which means all the old not odd numbers that were there to begin with are still there. So I'm also going to include that 2n minus 1 there. Okay. And then this becomes, if you distribute the 2 through, 2 times n plus 2 minus 1, which becomes 2n plus 1. Okay, now there's a second way that I know that's equal to 2n plus 1. Each new odd integer is 2 more than the previous one. Each new odd integer is 2 more than the previous one. So if I start at 2n minus 1 and add 2, that would get me to 2n plus 1. Okay. So um, now we're going to set up our limit. We want the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus 1 divided by a sub n. In the previous example, we saw that we had a fraction. Okay, n is going to go to infinity here. We had a fraction. We ended up dividing a fraction by a fraction. And so we took the reciprocal of the thing that was in the denominator. We took the reciprocal of the thing that was in the denominator. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to write a sub n plus 1. We do not need the absolute values because everything inside is positive. So a sub n plus 1 is 1 times 3 times 5, dot, 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 2n minus 1, 2n plus 1, all divided by 4 to the n plus 1, times n plus 1 factorial. Okay, we're sub, that's a sub n plus 1, right? Let me write that here. That's a sub n plus 1. Now I want to divide by a sub n. Dividing by a sub n is the reciprocal of, or is like multiplying by the reciprocal of a sub n. And so we're going to multiply here by that reciprocal which brings the 4 to the n and the n factorial to the numerator, and then the 1 times 3 times 5 out to 2n minus 1 in the denominator. Okay, now as before, I'm going to collect things that look alike, but I'm going to save myself a little bit of time. I see that 1, 3, and 5 are in both factors here, one in the numerator, one in the, denom in the denominator. Also, the 2n minus 1 is in both of those factors, one in the denominator, one in the numerator. Now, I want to make an important point. I find it very important to include that previous factor in these things because had I not done that, I wouldn't have seen that it canceled down here. I would not necessarily have seen that those two canceled. Okay, so now let's continue here. We will rewrite, <clears throat> this is the limit as n goes to infinity. Um, I'm going to bring things together that are alike. The 2n plus 1 is kind of all on its own at this point. The 4 to the n and the 4 to the n plus 1 will go together. And then the factorials are similar, right? n factorial, n plus 1 factorial. Let's simplify. Once again, just like in our previous example, I have an exponential expression. And so I've got n factors of 4 in the numerator 
n plus 1 factors of 4 in the denominator, which leaves us, after reducing, with 1 factor of 4 in the denominator and a 1 in the numerator. All right, we haven't done much with factorials, so I want to give you a little lesson down here. n factorial, remember, is the product of all numbers from n down to 1. So we're going to look at n plus 1 factorial because it's kind of funny. n plus 1 factorial would be all numbers starting at n plus 1 and making our way down to 1. Well, the next lowest factor after n plus 1 is n. The next lowest factor after that is n minus 1, and so on. Okay? Now what I want to do then is observe that the last bit here is exactly what n factorial is. That last bit is n factorial. So this is the same as n plus 1 times n factorial. Okay? n plus 1 factorial <clears throat> is the same as n plus 1 times n factorial. Okay? So let's go ahead and play with that. Let's put that in. So I have, we're going to multiply by n factorial. In the denominator, the n plus 1 factorial becomes n plus 1 times n factorial. Now those factorials will reduce. And we can let n go to infinity. Well, before we do that, let's rewrite our thing just so we're, uh, we're making things look pretty. Limit as n goes to infinity. I've got, what do I have in the numerator? The only thing I have in the numerator is the 2n plus 1. In the denominator, I only have 4 times n plus 1. Okay, so we let n go to infinity. If I do that, just like before, anything that doesn't have a, an n in it, in this case, will not really be significant. For large values of n, in 2n plus 1, the 1 is insignificant. In, for large values of n, the 1 in the n plus 1 in the denominator there is insignificant. So we end up with 2n over n. This is going to be the same thing as the limit as n goes to infinity, I said that wrong, 2n over 4n, which reduces to 2 fourths or 1 half. Now, we did all this work, and I forget why I was doing it. I was doing it because I was doing the ratio test. When I'm done with the ratio test, I determine how that number compares to 1. It's less than 1. So the series... <clears throat> The series converges absolutely by the ratio test. Our next example is kind of a classic one. We'll see a familiar thing here, and in the end I'm going to show you that I wasted a lot of time, but don't worry about that. Okay, um, this one's going to take some creativity and I wouldn't say trivia, but some sort of uncommon knowledge in mathematics as well. In this case, a sub n is n to the nth over n factorial, which means that a sub n plus 1 is n plus 1 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. We're going to look at the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. Again, each of these are fractions. When I divide, I can divide multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator instead. All of them also are positive, so I will not write absolute values anymore. a sub n plus 1 was n plus 1 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. Dividing by a sub n is multiplying by its reciprocal, so we have n factorial divided by n to the n. Okay, so let's do some simplifying here. Um, well, let's group those n fact. Let's group the factorial guys together. I've got the limit as n goes to infinity of let's see here, um, n plus one to the n plus one. I'm going to divide that by n to the n. Those are kind of weird exponential types of things. And then the n factorial, I'm going to put over n plus one factorial 
but as I did in the last example, I'm going to write that as n plus 1 times n factorial. <clears throat> now that's nice because those will reduce n factorial divided by n factorial equals 1. And now I need to know what to do with the other business over here. Well, I have two things raised to powers. One of them is raised to the n plus first power. The other is raised to the nth power. Okay, so, well, if they were the same power, I could put them together as one fraction. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the n plus 1 that's up here, and I'm going to split it up as n plus 1 to the nth power times n plus 1. So what do we end up with? We've got n plus 1 to the nth power multiplied by n plus 1. Those two together will give us n plus 1 to the n plus 1. In the denominator, I have n to the nth. Now, we don't want to forget our 1 over n plus 1 from the previous work. And that's nice because the n plus 1 that just was produced by um, that rewriting is going to reduce with the n plus 1 in the denominator. And now that we look at it, actually, we might have seen that before. You have n plus 1 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 to the first. If you subtract the exponents, you end up with n plus 1 minus 1, which gives us n. Because those both have a power of n, I can write them as one fraction to the nth power. So we have oops, n plus 1 over n to the nth power. Now, most people would not look at this and say they know what that approach is. Um, you can start thinking about it. The inside guts approach 1, do they not? The inside guts approach 1. So 1 to any power is 1. So you might think this approach is 1. However, this number is slightly larger than 1. No matter how big n is, this number is slightly larger than 1. If you take a number larger than 1 and raise it to an extraordinarily large number, you usually get an extraordinarily large number. Okay? So they kind of counterbalance each other. When you learned L'Hopital's rule, you may have learned that this is what's known as a 1 to the infinity indeterminate form. So you could use L'Hopital's rule, which requires some crazy gymnastics with exponential functions and logs. I'm going to um, do something that doesn't require that, but it does require a little bit of um, rather, I don't want to say obscure knowledge, but an uncommon knowledge. I'm going to, as we did in one of the previous slides, I'm going to write that n plus 1 over n as n over n plus 1 over n. Well, that reduces to 1 plus 1 over n to the nth. Now, this is actually a famous limit. It's a famous limit. At some point in your calculus experience, you probably encountered it. Okay. If you want to, take a moment, pause the video, take several values of n, some large values of n, and see what it approaches. Just pause the video and go ahead and do that. Turns out that this approaches the magic number E, that guy who's approximately 2.718. Okay, that's actually one of the ways we introduce E, maybe in a college algebra course or um, some other circumstances that you might encounter it in calculus. Now, we were doing all of this to compare the limit to 1. This is actually greater than 1, so the series diverges, and it diverges by the ratio test. Okay, there is no such thing as absolute divergence. Don't tell me that something diverges absolutely. That doesn't make any sense. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say um, we wasted a lot of time with this problem, but it did give us a nice um, workout with some exponents, exponents, the factorials, and re allowed us to review this little rule here, or this, de or this um, fact about the the limit and being related to e. So why did I waste my time? Let's look at the terms 
when n is equal to, let's say, 5. If we have n equals 5, then the numerator is going to be 5 to the 5th divided by 5 factorial. This is the reason that the ratio test is so good on things that involve factorials and exponential things. Let's think about what this means. When you raise something to the fifth power, it means you have that many copies of that. You have, um, when you raise something to the fifth power, it means you have five factors of that. So we're going to have five times five times five times five times five. In the denominator, five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. I don't think it takes too much to convince us that this is greater than one. Okay. In fact, as n goes to infinity, n to the nth divided by n factorial also goes to infinity. Because the terms do not approach zero, the series diverges by the divergence test. So although we spent a little bit more time on this problem than we needed to, it was, as I said before, a good review of exponents and um, factorials and how you can manipulate those. For our last example, we will um, have a little bit of exercise with some more factorial work. So this is a good one for that purpose. All right, so our a sub n is negative 2 to the nth times n factorial over the quantity 2n factorial. a sub n plus 1, we're going to be very careful with this. Every n gets replaced by n plus 1. Negative 2 to the n plus 1, n plus 1 factorial. In the denominator, we have 2 times n. a sub n is 2 times n a sub n plus 1 would be 2 times the quantity n plus 1. Okay, so um, that becomes 2n plus 2 factorial. Okay, now before we get into this problem, I'm going to um, discuss this 2n plus 2 factorial. I looked like I was really excited there when I wrote that factorial. Okay, let's write it like this instead, in factorial, that we go. Okay, um, that's 2n plus 2 factorial. Let's think about 2n plus 2 factorial. You'll see why I'm doing this now. 2n plus 2 factorial is the product of all integers, positive integers, from 2n plus 2 down to 1. So the first factor would be 2n plus 2. The second factor would be 1 less than that, 2n plus 1. The next factor would be 1 less than that, which is 2n, and then 2n minus 1, and so on, all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. Now, why did I do that? The reason I did that was because these last, this last bit <clears throat> whoops, I lost my times 1 there. The last bit here is precisely 2n factorial. It's the product of all integers from 2n down to 1. And so this is 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 multiplied by 2n factorial. Okay, the reason I did that, I'm going to give you a heads up. The reason I did that is because as I'm doing this problem, I'm going to, I'm going to encounter 2n plus 2 factorial and I'm going to encounter 2n factorial. One will be in the numerator, one will be in the denominator. And when we simplify it, it'll be helpful to be able to write the 2n plus 2 factorial as this. So we look at the limit as n goes to infinity. Absolute value of a sub n plus 1. Well, that's the negative 2 to the n plus 1 times n plus 1 factorial divided by 2n plus 2 factorial divided by a sub n. a sub n is a fraction. Dividing by the fraction is like multiplying by its reciprocal. So I've got the 2n factorial in the numerator, which used to be in the denominator, the negative 2 to the nth in the denominator, and the n factorial in the denominator. Okay. Group things that are alike together. 
we have the limit as n goes to infinity, absolute value, the powers of negative 2 can go together, negative 2 to the n plus 1 divided by negative 2 to the nth. The factorials without the 2s in them should go together. So the n plus 1 factorial over the n factorial. <clears throat> and the ones that do involve the 2 will go together as well. They're kind of similar. So now I'm going to simplify some. We've got the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, so let's see here. We've got the absolute value still. The first fraction has lots of powers of 2, right? I've got n or negative 2. n plus 1 factors of negative 2 in the numerator, n factors of negative 2 in the denominator. So that leaves us with one extra factor in the numerator, so we just end up with negative 2 from that first one. From the second one, as we've done before, we're going to peel off the n plus 1 from the n factorial. n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial. And now you can see why I did the little factorial work out above. The 2n plus 2 factorial from above is 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1 times 2n factorial. The reason I did this workout up here was getting us prepared for that, where I took the 2n plus 2 factorial, where it is 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 2 times 2n factorial. Now we can reduce. The n factorials will reduce. The 2n factorials will reduce. And I think we're pretty close to being ready here, aren't we? I think so. <clears throat> so let's see here. Um, we have the limit as n goes to infinity. Absolute value of negative 2. Let's deal with that. The absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2, so I can ignore the absolute values now. In the numerator, we'll have a positive 2 times n plus 1. In the denominator, we have 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1. n is going to infinity. In the numerator, we have a linear factor, or a linear expression. In the denominator, if you multiply it out, you have a quadratic. Quadratics beat linear. If you really want the details, this is the limit as n goes to infinity. Um, it would be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity. Again, only keep the highest power that's there. n plus 1 is going to infinity. Of those, n is the most influential, so that's 2n. In the denominator, we have 2n plus 2. For large values of n, the plus 2 is insignificant, so we just have 2n. In the second factor, we have 2n plus 1. Again, the plus 1 is insignificant. We have 2n. The 2n's reduce. Let's put a 1 there to, as a placeholder and 1 over 2n approaches 0. We're using the ratio test, and the ratio test asks us to compare this to 1, and it's less than 1. So our series converges absolutely by the ratio test. The ratio test is going to be very important when we start studying power series. In a power series, we, our series do not only involve x or n's, like this involves n's and constants, but we'll also maybe throw in something like an x to the n as well, a variable. And we'll ask for which values of x will that converge, okay? So it's a very, um, the ratio test is a very powerful and a very useful thing for some upcoming material.